please take the Bible and turn with me this evening to the Old Testament book of Genesis and chapter 32. Genesis chapter 32. May I say what a blessing it is to be back at Temple Baptist Church. <clears throat> My wife and I have now been back here for several weeks with our two children. And we've been so encouraged, as I mentioned before, uh, to hear about how you've been praying, not only for us, but for the work there in the United Kingdom. And we're trusting that the Lord will continue to bless. That is an extension of this ministry. And what is happening here on a weekly basis is happening there. And the same Savior is at work there that is at work here. What a blessing it is to see people who have a, a real vision for God to work in this world and I'm so grateful to be here tonight and have this real privilege to speak and I'd like to thank Pastor Sexton for this opportunity. Let's begin our reading in chapter 32 verse 1 and we'll read to the end of verse 11. And Jacob went on his way and the angels of God met him and when Jacob saw them he said this is God's host and he called the name of that place Mah Mahanam. And Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau, his brother, unto the land of Seir, the country of Edom. And he commanded them, saying, Thus shall ye speak unto my lord Esau, thy servant Jacob, saith thus, I have sojourned with Laban, and stayed there until now, and I have oxen, and asses, flocks, and men servants, and women servants. And I have sent to tell my lord that I may, that I may find grace in thy sight." And the messengers returned to Jacob, saying, We came to thy brother Esau, and also he cometh to meet thee, and four hundred men with him. Then Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed, and he divided the people that was with him, and the flocks and the herds and the camels into two bands, and said, If Esau come to the one company and smite it, then the other company which is left shall escape. And Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham, and God of my father Isaac, the Lord which saidst unto me, Return unto thy country, and to thy kindred, and I will deal well with thee, I am not worthy of the least of all the mercies, and of all the truth which thou hast showed unto thy servant. For with my staff I passed over this Jordan, and now I am become two bands. Deliver me, I pray thee, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, lest he will come and smite me and the mother with the children. Very interesting passage of scripture. I'd like to draw your attention this evening to verse 10 and read again the verse. I am not worthy of the least of all the mercies and of all the truth, which thou hast showed unto thy servant. Notice this phrase, for with my staff I passed over this Jordan, and now I am become two bands. Uh, this passage of scripture spoke to me. It leapt off the page to me just a, a few weeks ago. As my wife and I came back to the McGee Tyson Airport, got off the airplane, got all of our luggage, 15 pieces of luggage altogether, trunks, car seats, strollers, suitcases, and they all made it, which is a miracle in itself. And as we got all of those bags and boxes and car seats and strollers and all the things that were there off of the conveyor belt, and we began to put them in a vehicle, I began to think about something, a wonderful thing that I, that I just recalled as we were putting those boxes in a, a vehicle that 11 years ago and 17 days before, my wife and I were at McGee Tyson Airport and we had just two or three suitcases. We didn't have two children. And we certainly didn't know what would happen. But I would say this with Jacob. We went out empty and came back full. And just for a few moments this evening, I'd like to speak about the great blessings that God has given us. If you turn just for a moment with me to the book of Acts chapter 14, this is really what I seek to do this evening. Acts chapter 14, Paul on his missionary journey 
coming from the church which was at Antioch, he and Barnabas making journeys to Derbe and Lystra and Iconium. And on their return journey, they stop back at their home church, at their sending church. And we find here in Acts 14, verse 25, what happened. And when they had preached the word in Perga, they went down into Italia, verse 26 of Acts 14, and thence sailed to Antioch, from whence they had been recommended to the grace of God for the work which they fulfilled. And when they were come and had gathered the church together, they rehearsed all that God had done with them and how he had opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles. What an amazing thing. The church at Antioch heard how God had done marvelous things. And I find a very interesting word in verse 27. It is this word, with all that God had done with them. The young people that are studying Greek, I spoke to a few that were having a Greek quiz on Friday and this is one of the words, it's an interesting word. It's given in an instrumentive sense. That means that God did with Paul and Barnabas something special, like tools, like instruments in God's hand. If you were to call uh, the School of Trades and Technology and they were to repair your automobile, you wouldn't say to them, my, you must have some very amazing screwdrivers. You must have some amazing ratchets and sockets and wrenches. No, you wouldn't congratulate the tools. You'd congratulate the mechanic that used them. And in the same sense, we went over with no idea what would happen, with no clue as far as what would go and come and all the things that would occur. But God, in his graciousness, and according to what we read a few moments ago, in his mercy, used us for God's glory. Amen. And in that, he used you. And what I'd like to do this evening is just go back to our text, Genesis chapter 32, and rehearse to you, to thank you, to praise the Lord especially for all that he has done, not just in the UK, but what God is doing around the world. As I was walking through the airport, I thought this, uh, my two children, my wife and I have a three-year-old and a one-year-old, a son and a daughter, and I thought, you know, we would have never had these children. I would have never met my wife, Genevieve. I would have never gone to Great Britain if it wasn't for Pastor and Mrs. Sexton starting the college and I thought so many people could say they met their spouse here they've grown to love the Lord here what an amazing thing to think about all that God has done and yet God is at work in so many lives in so many ways and as we come back to our text I want you to notice here some things that we can see and I trust will encourage you and help you and be a blessing to you back in our text the beginning of verse 10 tells us this, I am not worthy of the least of all the mercies. First of all, I would like to bring a recognition of God's goodness. I believe that's necessary. As Jacob here is coming to meet his brother and he's fearful, he recognizes something very important. First of all, I'm not worthy of the least of all the mercies. In other words, it wasn't Jacob's goodness that brought him to this point to have all the blessings. He went over Jordan with just the staff and now he's coming back with such family and with such flocks as now he has to divide them into two bands. And I felt much the same way as we returned. And yet it is not because of our abilities or our gifts. It is because the mercy of God and as Jacob speaks here, and what a truth he states, I am not worthy of the least of all the mercies. If you were to put me on a list of people who would be likely to succeed, I'd be somewhere at the bottom if I'd even make the list. And it's not my ability and it's not your ability. It's not your giftedness. It's not your talent. It's the mercies of God that have brought us to this place. How many times in your past should you have failed and fallen and never gotten up and yet God's mercy took you and helped you? And what a wonderful Savior we have. I think about all that God has done for us and I think about all the mercies he's given to us. Turn with me just to a contrasting verse. Ruth chapter 1. Here's something interesting to me. Jacob went out empty. He spent about 20 years in this land of Haran with his father-in-law Laban and with his wife and his wives and family now. 20 years later, he returns. And as he returns, he thinks about all the blessings that God has given him. Notice in contrasting verse Ruth chapter 1 here, Naomi speaks and she says this, verse 21, I went out full and the Lord hath brought me home again empty. Think of that. If you understand the context of Ruth chapter 1, back in verses 3 and 4, Naomi's husband decides to go down to Moab and to follow his 
his heart and to follow his desires and to go away from the plan of God. And here is a great truth we can understand very simply. When I follow God, he brings me back full. And when I follow myself and my own desires, I come back empty. Something to think about this evening. I'm so grateful that God gives mercy to us. What a merciful God we have. I think about all the things that God has done. We need to give recognition to God's goodness. We went to England with just a few suitcases each and we didn't know anyone other than Mr. and Mrs. Evans who were there. And they had really opened up the doors of things and helped us. Uh, but when we got there, so many challenges took place. After a short time, they came back here to the United States and my wife and I were there by ourselves. We didn't have... UK driver's licenses. We didn't know how to drive on the, well, you, you debate with the British people, the right or the wrong side of the road. We didn't know how to do all those things. And God has been so merciful to us. We preached, we passed out gospel tracts, we leafleted, we tried to get people in and we worked so hard and one lady came named Jan the first time I ever preached at Beaches Road Baptist Chapel. She came, she left about halfway through the sermon. We tried to get her back again and she came and her boyfriend came. He was drunk. And Jan's boyfriend, during the sermon, thought it would be a good idea to go out while I was preaching and try to light the church on fire. He got a can of gas and a lighter, and he tried to light the church on fire. During the sermon, we were able to help him not light the church on fire. That was a good thing. <laughs> Somebody says, that church is on fire. Yes. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> Amazing. He say, that, what do you write home in your prayer letter about that? I don't know. What a failure. You have one lady and her, her boyfriend. My wife would take Jan after the service was over while I would try to distract her boyfriend. He was about 6 foot 14. He had a red beard and red hair. He looked like something that Valhalla just burped up and he was very, very unkind. And I would try to distract him. And while I was trying to distract him, Genevieve would sneak. He'd put her coat over Jan, sneak her out the back door, around the bushes, in the car. She'd lay on the floor of the car. My wife would zoom out of the driveway as quickly as she could before the boyfriend found her and beat her up again. And we thought, what are we doing? We don't know what we're doing. And God was merciful to us. All that God has done. We had a, a Christian man who said to us, I'm going to do everything I can to make sure you don't stay here in England. He was kind enough to let everybody know that we had all kinds of issues and we were problematic people and he did his best to run our name and Pastor Sexton's name into the ground as much as he could. And I can remember very distinctly getting a phone call from a man who said, do you know this man? And I said, yes, I, I've never met him, but I know who he is. And the man said, do you know what he's saying about you? And I said, yes, I do. And he said, well, if he's saying things like that about you, I know him and I know his character and we couldn't think of a better group to give our church building to than you all. If he thinks badly of you, you must be doing just the right thing. So we'd like to give you a church building. Is that amazing? I am not worthy of the least of all the mercies. And yet God, when we went out with just two suitcases, we've come back with so many blessings. We went out empty, we've come back full. Why? God is at work. And I'm not worthy of the least of the mercies, but God is at work. We've seen God do so many things. We've seen families put together. We've seen people's lives changed. We've seen the gospel work. Someone said, how do you expect to ever start a church? We have four things that we start a church with. Four things. First of all is the Holy Spirit. He is indispensable in church planting. Amen. Secondly is the Word of God. That is indispensable in church planting. Third thing, the gospel. The gospel is preached and must be preached and must be spoken. And then the fourth thing, a hymn book. Those four things, and God has blessed and used those four things in such a way where we've seen God do amazing things. And as people have, have come, we came to the church one night, and as we were leaving, we prayed and, and thought, what will happen every week vandalism happened? There wasn't a week that went by for some months where we wouldn't come and one of our cars would be stolen, a window broken, all the, the tires slashed on the church bus. One time we came back and uh, 
I think about 43 of the church windows were all broken. And you think, what is happening here? And we would say this. God has brought us so far from those days. If you were to go to Beaches Road Baptist Chapel or to any of the other churches that have been started in England today by God's grace, you would find some of the kindest people that have ever set foot on English soil. You, you would find lovely Christian people. What happened? God is with us. He's at work. And I want to recognize his goodness to us and the blessings he's given to us. Secondly, in our text there is a remembrance of where God brought us from. Notice again verse 10. For with my staff I passed over this Jordan. I can remember very specifically getting married and a few weeks later going to England. And we didn't know what to expect. My wife was thinking what kind of weather will it be and uh, all those things. And we just had a few suitcases. And as we went over we didn't know what we'd find. We got to a place of the lease, I think, was signed just as we arrived, and we arrived at a place uh, that didn't have any curtains, forks, knives, spoons, shower curtains, towels, mattresses, furniture, car, anything. And God sent us there in that place, and in 10 days, Pastor and Mrs. Sexton and a group of students were coming, 13 in all, plus Pastor and Mrs. Sexton. And they needed a place to stay. They needed transportation. Did you know what? In those 10 days, God provided every spoon, fork, knife, towel, cup, bowl, saucer, furniture, everything imaginable, cars. God provided all these things, and we went out empty. We didn't have but a few suitcases, and within 10 days, God had provided everything we needed to see the extension of Crown College go forward there. That's a miracle. That is amazing. God has blessed us so much and we must thank him for his physical blessings he's given to us. I can remember going to the town near where we lived and I saw a tool shop going out of business. And I went in and I said to the man, what are you doing with your tools? And he said, well, because of our uh, policy, I have to take all the tools that are on display, cut the cords off them and throw them in the dumpster. And I said, would you mind if I... Uh, dug around in your dumpster. He said, well, we don't really do that kind of thing, but I guess if you'd like to, I, I suppose you could. Well, don't you know we'd been praying for tools to rebuild things and do everything we needed to? And I, I got on that dumpster, and I, it was like Christmas morning and birthday and everything put together. I got power saws and everything imaginable you could find, electrical power tools for free. God blessed us so much with all these things. And I so, I'm so grateful for what Pastor Sexton said to me. He said when we went, you need to trust God for your needs. Now, if you get in a situation where you absolutely need something, let me know. But you pray and trust God. I'm thankful he did that because it brought us to pray and depend on God. Instead of just calling up and saying, hey, we need some more money. Could you send us this? Could you send us that? When we began to pray and seek God, he began to meet our needs. And now what wonderful things happen because God has blessed us. I can remember the first three months we had a church service, we never got anything in the offering. I mean anything. And about eight months into our church plant, I can remember very specifically, we counted the offering after the service and we got our first paper money. It was amazing. I did a lap around the church. I thought, this is amazing. A five pound note is in the offering. And you say, from such meager beginnings, what has happened? Could I say this to you now? Beaches Road Baptist Chapel is not only able to pay its own light bills and support itself financially, but it's able to support the other church plants that have been started in other places around England and buy mini buses and, and things to pick up children. What an amazing thing God has done. We went out with nothing and we, we come back loaded with blessings. I remember getting a car as we were thinking about what God would do and I found something on eBay. I mentioned this to you a, a few times ago, but the man I bought it from, I didn't know it till I bought it, but he kept two great bull mastiffs in the, the van. It was his dog house. The fifth gear didn't work, reverse didn't work, all those things didn't happen, but we bought it and we couldn't do anything about it. And that was our vehicle. But you know, the Lord helped us. And it ran. We got over 500,000 miles out of that van. Did you know that as of today, somewhere between 25 and 29 vehicles have been given to the ministry? I don't mean old clunkers. I mean very good minibuses, cars, vans, minivans, even a motorcycle. I enjoyed that one. That was amazing. 
God has blessed us in so many ways. And we went out with not a vehicle. And today we could say we have 25, I don't even know, I've lost count, somewhere between 25 and 30 vehicles that have been given to us. God has been so good. But more than that, there are people that God has changed. I can remember speaking to a, a woman who was so very foul-mouthed and so very unkind in certain ways. The people who would visit her would find her argumentative. They'd find her sometimes hung over, and her life was a mess. If you had come to our church today, you would see that she is one of the greatest workers and encouragers and helpers in our church, helping other people. Why? Because Jesus Christ transformed her life. That's what God does. And we went out not knowing anything and we come back and we could say with Jacob, I just went over with the staff I had. I, I didn't have anything at all really when we crossed the Jordan, but I come back and now we're two bands. We're so blessed by God and he's given us so much. Lastly, let me say this. There is a reproducing of life that is necessary. There is something that happens here, if you'll notice at the end of verse 10, and now I am become two bands. God has worked in such a mighty way. Jacob went over. By the way, Jacob was not a stalwart man of faith. He was a deceiver, a heel grabber, uh, someone who was not the most upright in his dealings. But because of God's mercies, God blessed and used Jacob. And now Jacob is returning to his homeland. If you'll notice verse 9, the heart of the verse tells us, The Lord which saidst unto me, return unto thy country and to thy kindred. He's now following God. And as he follows God back across the Jordan, he says, I came across, I remember this place where I crossed. And when I crossed here at the Jordan 20 years ago, all I had in my hand was a stick. And when I come back to this place, I remember maybe that tree and maybe here's a rock and I'm going to ford the Jordan at the very same place I was 20 years ago. But now, instead of just a staff in my hand, I have a family so large, flocks so massive, I have two bands to travel over with me. Isn't it amazing what God does in his mercy? And here, as Jacob speaks about this, I'm not worthy of the least of all the truth. Jacob had truth that had been carried from Abraham to Isaac, now to him, and he recognizes, I'm not a worthy recipient of this, but I'm so grateful. God has been merciful to give me this, and now he understands there is something that's been happening. Turn back to Genesis chapter 27 for a moment, would you please? What was Jacob involved in when he was back home? Chapter 27, the Bible says this, and Verse 8, his mother speaking, Now therefore, my son, obey my voice according to that which I command thee. Go now to the flock and fetch from thence two good kids of the goats, and I will make them savory meat for thy father, such as he loveth. You'll go on to read the rest of the story, and Jacob is very familiar with the flock. That's what he did back home. And when he went and traveled to Haran for 20 years, do you know what he did there? He did what he had learned to do at home. Could I just make a... Very brief application to that. Do you know what's happening all around the world? In every inhabited continent today, there are missionaries who sat right in these pews and learned what God was doing in this world and learned about Bible preaching and learned about reverent worship and learned about the greatness of God and His holiness and purity. And today, the sun has already set in England it's nearly tomorrow in Australia and all around the planet today. People are doing what they learned to do here at Temple Baptist Church. Isn't that amazing? The influence that you have, that God has given you, the mercies he's shown us collectively are amazing. And as we look at the reproduction here that happened, we see that his flocks were increased, that he and his family was increased can I say this, as we went over to start a Sunday school, we worked so very hard, and the first time we had Sunday school, no one came. Then one came, we were excited that three came, and then we grew back to zero for quite a number of weeks. No one came at all. I can remember meeting with the other Sunday school workers, and we sat down, and we were praying, and one of them began to weep, and we thought, could we ever maybe have 12? It seemed impossible. Could we ever have a core of 12 children in this Sunday school? 
And we thought, oh, I don't know if that would ever happen. It may be 10 or 15 or 20 years before that happened, but it'd be amazing if it would. Could I say to you today that in every one of the 10 regions of England, there has been a gospel preaching, Bible teaching Sunday school established for God's glory in those places. Many Sunday schools have been started. And also what we've seen uh, just back in the month of May, 450 young people, children coming to the Sunday school parade, seeing God bring again to life the Sunday school movement. What an amazing thing to see what God has done. This is God's doing. Reaching a new generation with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Camp Victory, Pastor Sexton said you should start a camp over there. We did. We, we rented a place. We had no kitchen. We used a, a garden hose and a propane uh, grill to feed everybody that came. And we thought we need a place where we can have a camp and a place where we can have a campus. And Pastor Sexton said pray that God will provide a place and we began to pray. Many of you know about Crown Hall. We began with 12 pounds. That's about, oh, 16 or $17 in our building account, our savings account. And when we went to the man who we found the perfect place after viewing about 200 properties, the man said, do you like it? We said, this is it. This is the place. We believe this is the place. He said, after all was said and done and all the bargaining was finished, 1.2 million pounds. That was at that time about $2 million and we had 12 pounds. We were well on our way. <laughs> and Pastor Sexton said to me, if this is what God wants, he'll provide. And did you know that within 90 days, 1.2 million pounds was given to the owners and we got the keys without a mortgage, without a bank loan, without owing some group somewhere in England, anything at all. God provided through people in America and people in the United Kingdom. God provided, and now we have a camp. We fed over 200 people through the week of our, our first camp, and then about 180 our second week of camp this past year, this past summer. It's amazing to see what God is doing. God is blessing and multiplying his work. And not only that, but we went over and no churches had been started. There was an empty chapel, and from that today, Oxford has been added. Tonight, Oxford will have had a problem fitting everybody in their, their place where they meet. There will be people standing outside. There will be people listening in the, in the children's room behind the chapel because they don't have enough room. They're looking for a new building. That's amazing, isn't it? And then in Brighton, we've been given a beautiful building there in a city that's known for its wickedness and immorality, and God is blessing there. And then in Tisley, East Birmingham, the most Islamic part of the Midlands, God gave us a place that Muslims were trying to buy, and he gave it to us to start a church in an Islamic part. You couldn't get much more Islamic than that part of England. And God gave us a place right there. They just texted me today, said they had a record number of attendants in their Sunday school. That's amazing. God is blessing. And then in Liverpool, God just gave us just a few months ago that place and God is blessing in a great way. They had a Bible club on Friday night. They had over 25. They were expecting over 30 in their Sunday school this morning, seeing things grow just a few months old. It's amazing to see what God has done. Five independent, fundamental Baptist churches who use God's word, who use the authorized version, who sing hymns of reverent worship to God, who understand that God is holy and the gospel still works and see people saved and baptized and growing in Christ and all that came from nothing, nothing because that's how God works. God brought all of that from nothing and I want to say to you what you have prayed for and given to and helped with and encouraged Pastor Sexton in, in heaven, what a day that will be. And you'll meet some people with different accents who say, oh, you're from Temple Baptist Church. Thank you. I'm here because you prayed. I'm here in heaven because you gave. I'm here because you loved Christ enough to support your pastor. When he had this fantastical idea to send people over to England, and now we'll rejoice in eternity to see what God has done. 
You know, this is the theme of all the Bible. Psalm 126, verse 6 says this, He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again, how? Rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. You can go out empty, and all you have in your hands is the gospel, and all you have in your heart is the Holy Ghost, and you can come back full. Would you bow in prayer with me this evening? Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for being a God who brings amazing things out of nothing. We thank Thee for bringing the truth to us and for Thy mercies that are new to us every morning. We thank Thee that this is a gospel place and Thou hast raised up this church to be a light not only in East Tennessee but around the world. And we pray that this church would be greatly blessed. May this just be the very beginning of what thou wilt do in this world through this place. Bless Pastor Mrs. Sexton. Bless those faithful members who pray and give and go. And help us be yielded to thee. Work in our hearts even tonight. Show us what we should do, where we need to go. And help us trust thee for great things. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. As your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, may I just ask you this question, where are you supposed to go? My wife and I were supposed to go to England. Now maybe you're supposed to go to work tomorrow. You say, I don't know what to do at work tomorrow. Will you trust God and be a witness? Will you see him do great things through your life? Maybe you go to university. Maybe you are at home and you need God's help. Will you go with the gospel? What is it that seems impossible in your life? You think this could never happen. A loved one that you believe will never be saved? Is it a stronghold in your life you think will never be overcome? Will you trust God with it this evening? I'm saying to you that if God could use me and my wife, if he could work in the United Kingdom, there's nothing that's impossible with God. He's able to use you here. Perhaps God is speaking to a person tonight about surrendering to the call to bring the gospel to people around the world. And you'd say, I want to surrender to that call this evening. Maybe God is giving you specific guidance. The Holy Spirit is at work. He's been working and he's working tonight. And I'd invite you this evening, if you need to do business with God, that you would do that this evening. Maybe you're here tonight without Christ and you're hopelessly lost and you're on your way to hell. Maybe others don't know that, but in your heart you do. And I would say to you, Jesus Christ is ready and willing and able to save and forgive you and change your life. While your heads are bowed, I'll turn the service over to Pastor Sexton. But I invite you this evening to truly leave right with God.